and you've stayed in the faith, you've tried to grow all the way, you're older now, so you're more mature, right? Well, that may be true in some cases and not true in other cases. Some people have 10 years of experience doing something, and so they have learned and they have grown in their ability to do whatever. Other people have one year experience 10 times over in the same period of time. They haven't really grown, they just do the same thing over and over. And that's true, I think, of the Christian faith. Some people learn to live as Christians uh, incrementally and they get stronger in the faith. I think that's the kind of maturity that we are talking about when Jesus says he wants us to pray so that we'll be, we will become more mature. There's a Bible word for that. The Greek is teleos. And it literally means functional. It means that you are doing what you were created to do. Those pews that you're sitting on, they were manufactured so that they would hold you up when you sat down on them. And in that sense, they are teleos. They are mature. They are functional. What is a screwdriver used for? To turn the screw and put it into the wood, right? It is teleos if it is able to do that. Uh, it is functional. The Bible word teleos means that we function appropriately for the way that God has created us. That means we are mature. We are fully perfected, as Scripture would say in King James. That does not mean that we are sinless because we still have a sinful or a fallen nature. But it does mean that we are holy in the sense that we are growing in love more like the Master. God has a plan for our praying. God's plan and God's purpose for prayer is to help you and me develop an honest and deep relationship with Him so that we'll be able to hear His voice and draw close to Him and be blessed by walking daily with God. Now we learn that in the second chapter of Genesis, the second chapter of the entire scripture, when God has just created Adam. What did he say uh, after getting to know Adam a little bit? What did God say about Adam and relationship? He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. That's why he created Eve, because Adam needed human relationship. He needed human interaction. He needed to fellowship with somebody else. We are created in his image. He created Adam in his image. Adam passed that along to his sons and then to their sons and so on and so forth. We are created in the image of God. And therefore, if that image in Adam required relationship with other people, it stands to reason that the sun beam goes back up to the source, doesn't it? If we can see that Adam had need for relationship and Adam was created in the image of God, that means that God also has need of relationship. There is a mutual need, and God wants us to draw up close to him and be blessed by walking daily with him. We do that literally in prayer. We see that deep kind of a desire and relationship that Paul had, the Apostle Paul had, with uh, Philippi. He wrote to the Philippian church, chapter 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. Paul desired so much to be like Jesus so that he could understand the movement of Jesus. He, he could understand the call of Christ on his life so that he could understand what Christ wanted him to do. I want you to know, this is a parenthetical personal note, that this is my desire as well. I'm a person of prayer, but it is in the already now, but not yet since. By this I mean I, that I share that burning desire in my innermost parts to know Christ, like Paul wrote. That part of the kingdom reigns in me, but it is far from complete. I'm not nearly as functional. I'm not nearly as teleos. I'm not nearly as mature as I want to be in my relationship with God. I want to know him better and better and better. In all, 
I want you to know that in my life, prayer has been the one connecting thread in every aspect of my life that has kept me at various times from leaving the faith. Sometimes with the pressures of life, sometimes with the disappointment that you find in life, either in circumstances or people or health or job or finances or whatever, sometimes people get so overwhelmed Christians, even Christians that have long served the Lord, want to leave the faith. They just want to quit. Prayer has been the only thing that has kept me connected enough to God to sometimes not quit. It has also kept me from destroying the most important relationships in my life. You know, there are some times when those who are closest to you, uh, you know, especially during the time of the COVID pandemic, when we're, you know, we're huddled together, uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to take, you know, uh, to not get breaks, let's put it that way. Now, everybody stop looking at Elizabeth, I'm talking about her right now, I'm talking about some of my other relationships. But isn't it so that there are times when we could possibly destroy the most important relationships in our life if it were not for that deepest friend, friend of sinners that we know, and his name is Jesus, to whom we can talk and tell him our deep, deepest, innermost secrets. I tell him those things that are just driving us uh, to distraction, to being so pulled apart. Literally, prayer at times has just plain kept me from growing insane. Now, it's not that I live that much on the edge, but I do want you to understand that we all have these issues that we face, and prayer is God's gift to us to let us come closer to Him so that all of these pressures that come on us at times are pressures that are not going to overwhelm us. Prayer keeps me close to God, and it also keeps me, because it changes me. It changes me from Russell, the frazzled one, to Russell, who gets it and knows that God has it, and he's going to take care of it. So what I want to share with you this morning is the model of the kind of prayer that I use. It's the model of the kind of prayer that has changed me profoundly over the course of my life. This way of praying is easily remembered by the short acronym, the word ACTS. You know what an acronym is? It's a word that has letters, and each of the letters stands for other words. Well, this acronym of ACTS, just like the book of ACTS, uh, stands, these four letters stand for these words. A stands for adoration. When you pray, first thing you do is adore God. Secondly, confession. That's a good thing to do when you're going to talk to God because he knows already. T is thanksgiving, and then S is supplication. That's the grocery list. Usually we get that backwards. What do we usually start with? We start with the grocery list. Lord, you know I need such and such. Lord, I want this and this and this. And we move right to the shopping list of what we want, the supplication, so to speak. But it's not a shopping list supplication. We'll get into that in a moment. I did find that this was a model that was seen in many of the Old Testament prophets and leaders' way of praying. And uh, Nehemiah was one who was like that. I'd like for us to check on his prayer in the first chapter of Nehemiah. I did tell you we were going to go to Nehemiah. If you haven't found it yet in your Bible, you open it up to the center part. That's Psalms. Uh, take a left, go back three books, and you'll find Nehemiah. In chapter 1. Let me tell you a little bit about Nehemiah as we begin here. Nehemiah was part of the captive Israelite nation. Do you remember what happened? God's people had sinned, and God told them, when you sin, you're going to suffer for it. You're, I'm going to take you to the woodshed for it. And uh, he did. And Babylon came along. They conquered Israel. Israel was defeated. They lost the war. Many of their fine and most capable and promising people were carried off into the captivity a thousand miles away from their home. And there they were raised, and there uh, for 70 years they stayed in captivity. Nehemiah was one of the uh, captivity children. 
He had never seen Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. You know, some of the people that carried out of Jerusalem and back to Babylon, uh, uh, they did what, uh, what people normally do. They, they tried to carry on family life, and they had more children. Nehemiah was one of those people. And as he grew up, he grew up as a slave in the king's palace, and he became the king's cupbearer. Now you would say, wow, that's a, that is a pretty glorious job, you know, pretty important job, the king's cupbearer. Here's the king's cup. I'm going to bear, I'm going to carry the king's cup to him, carry his wine or whatever he's drinking. I'm going to carry it to him. Sounds like a pretty important, uh, you know, prestigious kind of job. Did you know what the king's cupbearer did? David, he really only had one job. It was to carry the cup to him. But before the king would take a sip, Nehemiah had to take a sip. <clears throat> Notice how deftly I needed a drink, and so I brought that into the sermon. You're not impressed, are you? <laughs> and then the king would drink, right? No. He would put it aside, and he would wait to see if Nehemiah keeled over. Uh, if there was poison in there, usually it was fast-acting poison, and he would die. So, uh, this was the job of Nehemiah. Here he is. He is the, he's grown up as a slave. He's a cupbearer to the king. And God picks Nehemiah to do a very difficult job. God wants to take Nehemiah out of Babylon, send him all the way back to Jerusalem, a thousand mile trip. And there he is to lead the people to rebuild not only the city walls, but the temple of God. And Nehemiah's burden for this, and he's about to go, and he's about to talk to the king about being able to do this. Very, very dangerous thing. Uh, what would happen if Nehemiah did, if he asked the king, is it okay if I do this? I go back to Jerusalem, who was your enemy, and now rebuild the city walls, rebuild and fortify the city walls, rebuild the temple so that they can worship there. Is that okay? You know, Chances are, and chances are probably 99 to 1, that a king, an ancient Babylonian king, would look at Nehemiah and say, Really? <laughs> you want to do what? And he would say to one of his soldiers, Take this guy out and separate his head from his shoulders right now. That was the odds. And so Nehemiah was facing great odds, great personal risk. And in preparing to enter the greatest task of Nehemiah's life, with great risk to his life, to his limb, Nehemiah hit his knees and he opened his heart to God with an axe kind of prayer. We see adoration, we see confession, we see thanksgiving, and then we see supplication. Let's dig in. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 5 says this, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant of his unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Nehemiah began his prayer with adoration. We begin our prayers with adoring God. What do you think it means to adore? Well, for me, it's that goofy look I get on my face when, uh, when I think about my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. You know, I adore those little ones. I don't want to spoil them rotten. I love them. No, that's not what adoring means in this particular case. By adoring, we mean recognizing who God is and responding to him accordingly. Nehemiah addresses God as great and awesome. I never thought of one of my children and grandchildren as great and awesome. I mean, it's an awesome thing, these little lives, yeah. But the God who keeps covenant. This is recognizing how magnificent, how there is none like him. That's what adoration is, is to recognize God for who he really is. To adore God is to respond to the covenant, the agreement that God offers. In Nehemiah's day, that meant obedience to the law, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is referred to as the law of Moses. That's why God says, this is bad, and that's bad, don't do this, don't do that, and certainly don't do that. This is how you act, this is good. This is what the law is. Now, our covenant as Christians has its foundation in that law, but the fulfillment of that law comes in Jesus Christ on Calvary with his blood shed. So Nehemiah starts with his prayer 
adoration. One of the reasons why you don't hear much of that anymore is because 21st century culture does not teach us to adore anyone but ourselves. We are the most important thing. What I think, what's best for me, that's what I adore. That's what I recognize, right? And it's a good practice if you're going to pray honestly, if you're going to pray as a Christian, you're going to pray, pray respectfully and meaningfully to Almighty God. It's an important and a good practice for you to stop very often and check to see who it is that's sitting on the throne of your heart. Who's calling the shots in your life? Who's most important to you? Is it you or is it God? Is it your family? Is it your job? Is it your dog? If it's not God, if you're the one that's sitting on the throne of your heart, it's not going to be God that you're adoring because it's impossible to serve two masters, Jesus said. It's impossible to recognize the sovereignty of God if you have someone else sitting on that throne. And if it's you, you are recognizing yourself as sovereign. And this leads naturally into the second movement beyond adoration in this symphony of prayer to confession. Now, if you're sitting on the throne in your heart and everything about you, and it's all about you, then there's no need for confession. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Nehemiah goes right from adoration to confession. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Nehemiah's confession is not a popular thing today. Today, if anything goes wrong, it's always somebody else's fault, right? Isn't that the way it is? Uh, you know, if, you get, if somebody looks at you the wrong way, well, it's not me that did that. By contrast, Nehemiah here. Nehemiah was born into the captivity, never laid eyes on Jerusalem. He's a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, and yet, never having set foot in the city, never having been there for all the sins that happened, don't forget this is 70 years later, and he was born into captivity. So all of the sinning that went on that God took his people to the woodshed for, all that happened before Nehemiah was even born. And yet, in the prayer, he says, we... Yes, me and my family have sinned greatly against you, Lord. He includes himself and his family in the guilt of the national sins of Israel. He said, wow, really? Yeah, really? Because Nehemiah is wise enough to know that had he been there 70 years prior, 120 years prior, had he been there when the worst of it was going on, he would have gone along too. See, Nehemiah knew his own heart just like you and I know our hearts. We need prayers of confession regularly. If we were going to have the Lord's Supper today, uh, somewhere along the line, there would be a time for us to confess our sins. That's in our liturgy because it is so important for us to have times of confessing our sins. Nehemiah knew his heart. You know your heart. I know my heart. We need prayers of confession regularly. And in the text, Nehemiah prays, and he says that we have sinned terribly. Literally, that word there means offended. We have offended holy God. He's admitting the actions of God's children are offensive to heaven. What acts are we talking about? Well, the people of Israel have started worshiping other gods. What is commandment number one? I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They sinned first degree, and it was of the highest magnitude. They were worshiping other gods when it is the Lord God Almighty, Jehovah Yahweh, who led them out of Egypt and took them out of bondage. That's what confession is about. It's recognizing our sins do indeed offend holy God. Well, once you have adored God in prayer and you've confessed your sins to him, then next comes T, which is thanksgiving. Uh, we go to verses 8 through 10. Please remember, uh, Nehemiah is praying to God, please remember what you told your servant Moses. 
If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. Parenthetically, before I finish that last verse, parenthetically, did that happen? Did the nation of Israel get scattered to the ends of the earth? They sure did, didn't they? And they remained that way until when? The year I was born, 1947. That's the year that Israel became a nation again. The, the early wars uh, go back in the early history of Israel. They got defeated any number of times, scattered, uh, and, and they were not a nation for those basically thousands of years. Suddenly, in our lifetime, my lifetime, certainly the year that I was born is when it began, Israel made their way back to that Palestinian stronghold where Jerusalem, the holy city, is. They are a nation, take it for granted today, but what a monumental effect that God had said to Moses, through Moses, to the people, I'll scatter you, but I will bring you back. That's the fulfillment of that prophecy. And finishing verse 10, the people that you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Lord, we're in your hand. We are your servants. Do with us what you will. Nehemiah is offering up thanksgiving. Now listen, let's, let's talk a word about thanksgiving here. It's one thing to give thanks, to say thank you for a gift that you really like, isn't it? I mean, have you ever gotten a gift that you really like that you didn't say thank you for? I, I never have. I mean, you know, when a gift wows me, I, wow, you, you can't, how wonderful. I mean, if somebody handed you the keys to a brand new Cadillac and said it's out there in the driveway, it's yours, it's all paid for, would you say thank you? Yeah. Boy, I would. Matter of fact, I'm up for that if any of you are so It's quite another thing to say, bless you, when you get hauled to the woodshed and you get the tar knocked out of you. Yes, that is exactly what Nehemiah has in mind here. Basically what he's saying here, he's rehearsing the fact that God said, listen, you sin and I'll whip your butt. I'll hunt you down, I'll bring you back, and we can do it all over again if that's what you want. Nehemiah is saying, thank you for that. Why is he saying that? And how is he saying it? He's saying, Lord, thank you so much for following through on your promise that if Israel sinned, you, there would be a reckoning, that you would bring judgment down on us and we would pay the price. And we did and you did. Thank you for following through on that. And then thank you for drawing us back together close to you. What is Nehemiah saying here? What in the world could make him say that? Why would he respond to God that way? Because Nehemiah is acknowledging God's faithfulness to punish sin. It gives substance to our belief in all the other promises of God. Do you get that? All of God's promises to care for us and to love us and to provide for us and protect us, all of that goes down the drain if the other thing about punishment isn't true. How many of you grew up? Okay, some of you are still infants, all right? We, we all get born and you know, we, we grew up, right? Um, you grew up under the tutelage of somebody, somebody cared for you when you were a child. May have been a parent, may have been a foster parent, may have been an adoptive parent, may have been a state, it may have been and you know, but you submitted to their authority. Were there good times and bad times and all that? I can tell you that Mr. and Mrs. Brownworth's little boy understood that. I, I understood that if I did something wrong at school, by the time I got home, everybody knew about it. Everybody, you know, and, and I was going to pay the consequence of it. As simple as that. That's the way it was in the day that I grew up. There are consequences. There are actions. For every action, there is a consequence. What Nehemiah is 
showing us here with his prayer of thanksgiving to God for God having laid out the law and said, listen, if you don't worship me, if you put aside worshiping me, what's going to happen is you're going to scatter and you're going to suffer and you're going to be a people without a nation. And that was so for more than 3,000 years. But that underlines the fact that God has said, I will love you and I will care for you. If God is true at one point, he's true at the other point. And if he's false at any point, he's not true at any point. Nehemiah is saying, thank you for your faithfulness. Yeah, it's tough to suffer all that stuff. But thank you for your faithfulness. And so we come, <clears throat> we come to the last part. Our novel here is nearly complete. We have adoration, which is recognizing God for who he is and addressing him as such. We have confession which is recognizing who we are and confessing that to God and thanksgiving for God's faithfulness. And then the last part of our model here is supplication. That's the shopping list, so to speak. It's what we want God to do for us, literally. We find it in verse 11, where Nehemiah completes his prayer. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. What's he about to do? He's about to go on one of his little visits to the king with the cup in his hand. And he's going to say, by the way, there's something I've been meaning to talk to you about. Is it okay if I go back and help out your enemy, Jerusalem, to rebuild all of their strength and their temple? Is it okay? He's saying, Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. Now, there's always a decisive moment, isn't there, when talking or thinking is just not enough. There always is a moment in time when we have to have the rubber of our faith meet the road of action. In terms of praying and acting on prayers, the saying could be praise the Lord, but also pass the ammunition. You know, there's a time when praying ends and doing begins. Uh, that was the nature of the man, Nehemiah, and all the servant and prayer warriors. Uh, that Nehemiah committed himself to God and God's kingdom in his prayer. When he got up off his knees, what did he do then? He went ahead and picked up the cup, and he went to the king, and he asked him the $64,000 question. He said, is it all right if I do this? Nehemiah, I'm sure, went in faith, knowing that God, this is God's call. God tapped me on the shoulder. God said, do this. And so God is going to have to make a way, even against the 99 to 1 odds against this Babylonian king. Let me ask you a few questions. When is the last time you stepped out in that kind of faith? When is the last time God put in your heart to involve yourself in such a way, in something that didn't seem like it was going to work out, but you knew God was calling you to you, you to it, and you knew that if God didn't come through, man, it was over for you. You were toast in some way. Maybe your reputation, maybe your finances, maybe even your life, I don't know. But beloved friends, sisters, brothers in Christ, that is what supplication is all about. It's not just a shopping to say, Lord, I need this, or I want this. God, the kingdom needs this. It's saying, God, my supplication is to take me off of my own two feet, which I carry myself around with, and place myself in that offering plate on your altar. Supplication is a matter of dependency on God entirely. Supplication is kingdom living prayer. Perhaps the whole idea of that kind of prayer is somewhat scary. After all, God is all-consuming, he's all-powerful. And all that we have protecting us from that kind of an awesome power is our own excuses. And we know they won't fly any greater than a block of granite will. So what I'd like to do is close our time together with a little story from an old friend by the name of C.S. Lewis shed a little bit of light on what the next step is for those of us who are timid about how to approach the throne with that kind of a prayer. Where you really want to help. You want to do something for God. You want to listen to God's voice. You want to hear God's voice. 
But you want to step out. There is a time when the when the thinking, the adoration, the confession, and the thanksgiving, all of that ends in supplication. Lord, here I am. You're moving me to do such and such. Where do you take the first step? I don't know, and I'm afraid of it. Well, how do you pray? What do you think about doing that? Listen to this little story. It's in his book, The Silver Chair. C.S. Lewis draws this analogy with the story of a young girl by the name of Jill. She's living in a place called Narnia, Chronicles of Narnia. Jill is thirsty, and at the same time she sees a magnificent stream. She also sees a fearsome lion by the name of Aslan who stands or represents the Lord Jesus. So this is an analogy. Jill is you, and Aslan is Jesus. And you don't know what to expect. And here's what Jill says. I'm just going to read it to you. If I run away, that lion will be after me in a moment. And if I go on, I'll run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved if she had tried. And she couldn't take her eyes off it. How long this lasted, she couldn't be sure. It seemed like hours. And the thirst became so bad that she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion if only she could be sure of getting a mouthful of water first. <clears throat> Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could, could I, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious, rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill? I'd make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? She said. I've swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings, and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you'll die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that, and her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she ever had to do. But she went straight to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the lion the moment she had finished. Now, she realized this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all to go away. This standoff, when we come to the decision to put aside all of the safe prayers that we've ever prayed, you know, the now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer, or the shopping list kind of a prayer, when we decide to put away all the safe prayers to which we have become accustomed, we choose to really pray, to adore the God, recognize him for who he really is, as scary as Aslan may have looked at you, to confess that we're not worthy not to be, to offer our thanksgiving for all the ways that he straightened us out, and then to supplicate Bow down before Almighty God and say, I am in your hands. Do with me what you will. That is the bottom line in real kingdom prayer. We are either always making a choice to run from God 
work towards God. Jill had to do that with the water. But ultimately, despite our fear, despite deep within our hearts and souls, we know that the prayer of running to God will carry us one step closer for a drink of living water. May I be so bold to say it? That's what you really wanted anyway. The living water. Let's pray together. Father God, here we are again with our eyes closed, our heads bowed, and our souls conflicted. We really do want to pray. We want to be open and honest. We want to let everything just all hang out for you to examine. And we know that we worth it. The very best for our souls like that clear, refreshing water. We just let go and trust that you will still be true to your covenant. That you'll honor your son's blood spilled for our saving. Grant us courage to put the fear and the need to control and the flirtation with hiding our embarrassment. Help us to put all of that aside. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Cleanse us. We shall be holy. Purge us, and we will shine as your people. For the glory and the honor and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so, Lord, in each of our lives, we pray. Amen.